I am thrilled to be joined by my friend Jason Levian, co-chairman and CEO of DC United. Jason, thanks so much for taking some time. Uh, thanks for having me, Scott. It's great to see you. When you and I first uh, encountered each other, we would talk basketball, right? You, you were uh, part owner of the Memphis Grizzlies, but then you moved on to soccer. I'm just curious, on the overarch, what attracted you to soccer before a lot of other U.S. owners? I think the big the big growth opportunity, I had been a young attorney in Washington, D.C. when D.C. United launched, and it was awesome. And the club was dominant, um, and I saw what it did to the city. Um, and then when I went on in my career and was an investor in, you know, in, in the NBA uh, and a team operator, um, I really saw where soccer was headed, and I thought there's a lot of growth here, a lot of potential uh, in the U.S. market, and it was something that I wanted to participate in. Now, everybody's heard like the kids playing soccer, but you start to get now where American fans are watching overseas soccer, uh, you get the participation. What is it you think that is the real buoy for an investment in MLS? I think, I think if you go to elementary schools today, and my son is an elementary school student, and you see the number of kids showing up in soccer jerseys, uh, whether it's MLS or other countries around the world, and what they're talking about. Um, I think you see young people engaged in the game. I think the attention span uh, and the level of excitement and, and, and uh, that goes on in a soccer match uh, is special in, in terms of holding people's attention spans. Um, so I think it's they're really onto something. I think the game of soccer in the next coming generations is going to get bigger and bigger. Um, and the, the, the amount of action there is, uh, is just very engaging for fans in the stadium and also, you know, watching on their screens. What was your knee-jerk reaction to, on the whole, Sportico's MLS valuations? And then we'll get to DC United specifically, because I already got your text message and I know where that stands. <laughs> no, I'll tell you, Scott, I, I, first of all, I'm really glad you guys are doing it. I think it's really good work. Um, I think it was thorough. I thought it was interesting. Um, I think it was needed in the marketplace for people who are looking at sports investments to have uh, the, the research that was done. I think that was really helpful. So um, that's number one. When I heard that you guys were doing this, I thought it was, I thought it was really going to add some value to the sports business landscape. Um, obviously, you know, I have my own insights because we've been raising capital uh, and bringing in some partners um, on, the, on the tail end of hopefully what is the tail end of COVID. Um, and, you know, um, our, our valuation has been strong. Um, and it exceeds uh, by what, what, what you guys put for DC United. But overall, directionally, I think that uh, there was a lot of insight there in terms of where the league is headed, in terms of where the sport is headed in the U.S. Um, and there's still challenges, don't get me wrong. There's still obstacles and, and some big challenges. I think we've got a really good leadership team at the league level that can tackle those and a strong ownership group. Um, but, but I think directionally, what you guys produced uh, is very much in line with where I feel the league is headed. Where do where were we short? Do you think? Because we have DC United with six hundred thirty million. You probably said we were ten or twelve percent shy. It's hard. I th I think it's probably not in the numbers, not in what the analytics showed, but we may be shy on the scarcity value. That's yeah. the hardest thing to value. That if you want in the club, you've got to pay. And clearly, people at your valuations, we're clearly willing to pay a little bit more. But it's hard to value that scarcity though. Is that is that a huge driver in terms of pro sports? I think that's a huge, big factor in the people that I talk to that want to get in. I think specific to DC United, and and I don't, I don't criticize this, I think there are a lot of things going on in and around our stadium and our real estate and our sports betting licenses um, and the real estate that we have in, in the state of Virginia that, that adds a tremendous amount of value. And I think it's hard for someone doing a league-wide valuation to tap into all of that. So I think some of it is just market-specific, uh, what's happening in, in different markets. Um, some of it is probably the scarcity, but I think you guys got that. I think, you, I, think I, you know, I read the article. I, 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 you know, I, I, I try to read it very carefully. Um, and I think you did tap into what's happening, which is that there's scarcity for sports team ownership. And there's growth potential. There's a really good story to tell over the next decade to two decades of what's going to happen. And you combine those and you get you get real, real growth and valuation. I think what makes this really fun, not only for us to do on outsiders looking in, but for owners like yourself, is that there's so much opportunity because pro sports teams now, they, they used to be mom and pop organizations. 
but they're platform companies. They are global entertainment platform companies. And we take into account all the ancillary businesses, which includes real estate, which includes media. What do you think is the future of ownership in terms of the team being the hub of it all, the brand, but everything else that will circle around it? Scott, I think there's a massive opportunity. I, you know, when I got into this uh, 25 years ago, I got into the sports business um, and I was representing athletes and I was negotiating with general managers and team presidents and owners. Um, and then I became an investor. Um, and I remember um, when I put a group together to buy the Grizzlies, David Stern pulled me aside and he said, you know, I don't want to scare you, but you're paying a full value for this team. You know, I hope you know that. <laughs> and that was, you know, uh, 5%, 10% of what the, I think what that club is worth now. Um, I, but what you're saying really resonates with me because when we acquired DC United, the idea was we've got this great brand in an unbelievable market, in, in an international market. We needed a home stadium. And through that process of finding a downtown urban home stadium in what's now the fastest growing area in Washington, DC, and will be the most densely populated area in DC, what I realized is the opportunities are boundless once you have the team in terms of what you can do in public-private partnerships, what you can do with media, what you can do with real estate, uh, sports gaming, obviously a massive factor there, uh, what you can do in the community that adds value in the community, but also dramatically grows your asset value. So those are all the things that, that I'm focused on now that we're focused on at DC United is how do we get more ingrained in the DMV, the D DC, Maryland, Virginia area? Uh, what can we do on our real estate platform, our media platform, uh, in sports betting, um, wh what can we do in all of those areas that's driving value to the team and driving value to the overall business? And that that is something that um, originally when I got involved on the as a team operator, I wasn't as focused on, and that's where I'm hyper-focused today. Anytime we hear about sports betting, everybody brings up the one word, engagement, right? It's, it's gonna drive engagement. Great. Tell me how you monetize engagement. Well, listen, for us specifically, we have preferential treatment to get sports betting licenses our, ourselves, both in D.C. and DC. in the entire state and the state of Virginia. We've got a we've got a mobile platform in for the state of Virginia that we're partnering with Betfred on um, that will be statewide um, and that's launching very soon. Um, so in, in, in addition to engagement, uh, what we've done is found partnerships uh, and we're partnering with FanDuel in D.C., um, an exclusive partnership with FanDuel. So we're we're certainly focused on engagement and excitement among and growing our fan base, but actually we're a participant um, in the growing industry that's sports betting and sports gaming um, and doing that in a way that we can reap real benefits economically. I think you're a great at least test case for what we're seeing in media because you did try a streaming exclusive. Did, didn't work out exactly as you'd hope, but what did you learn and where do you think we're going? And we're going to get to the national media deal right after this, but sure. you've been there, you've done it. What did you learn? What did your customers tell you? What worked, what didn't? Yeah, we, we it was, you know, we, we tried and, and that did not, that, that did not succeed. Um, we, we tried a partnership um, that would have been an exclusive streaming platform for regionally for our games. Um, I think what we learned is that the sports bars that a lot of our fans were congregating at weren't ready for it. Uh, they weren't ready technologically for it. Um, we, we went, we had to go bar to bar to, to try to show them how to stream the games um, and how to get the package. Um, and it was, a, it, there were some real growing pains uh, from fans who love watching, uh, watching what we're doing. Um, and we're frustrated that we weren't on, uh, on a package that they were traditionally used to on cable TV. Um, we were probably a little bit ahead of our time. We did it a couple of years ago. Um, and our fan base for the most part, I think was happy with it, but there was enough of a minority of fans that were frustrated with it, that we needed to make a change. Um, so, but I think the engagement level, what we learned from our, our customers was interesting. Uh, the data showed us that, uh, there, there's real opportunity for that and, and growth for that. Um, and it's something we're going to certainly know, we know is important for us moving forward. So, uh, probably a little ahead of our time um, in doing that, and but but I'm, I'd rather try and fail at those things um, and tr really try to to, to capture uh, what's happening technologically in the future in terms of how people are consuming uh, our content. Um, so so I'm glad we tried it. 
Yeah, I, I don't say it just to, to rub any salt in wounds. I, I mean, you really were a little ahead because if you look now, any big time streaming event, you still see problems in almost all of them. And, and maybe it's just not there yet. Do you believe the fangs or the other? Do you think that streaming will at least emerge as an equal player in terms of broadcast rights? Or when will it happen? Or are we still right now stuck on the linear? I think I think the linear players are certainly investing in streaming um, so that they can combine both platforms. Uh, so I, I think it's trending in the streaming direction. Certainly, that's the, where the growth is. Um, but you, you still have there's a lot of advantages to linear. And so there are a lot of advantages to being on both. Uh, I guess I guess if we learned anything in our regional market was in D.C. was should we have uh, figured out a way just to be on both so that we weren't you know, upsetting anybody and we were getting the advantages of the streaming for those who wanted to take advantage of it. All right. Tell me about the national talks. Now you're an owner. You are probably having regular talks with Commissioner Garber. How are the talks going? Because I would assume also some of the valuation that you're seeing are prospective owners banking on what we saw in the NFL, what we hear about could be in the NBA, significant increases across all sports for content, content, content. They just got to have it. I, listen, I think that's right. I think it's a great time right now to be in MLS. It's, it's, it's probably the best time since I've been in the league. This is my 10th season. Um, why? Number one, and, and, and I will say that we've got labor peace. We, we, we struck a really good labor deal that I think um, the players and the owners, and I give a lot of credit to, to our commissioner uh, for getting that deal over the line. I know it wasn't easy in the middle of COVID. Um, yeah. I, I but, think but people I, overlooked in the NFL. One of the reasons for that massive NFL contract, yes, we know that's the gorilla out there, but the fact that they secured that 10-year labor deal prior to the discussions, the, the, the broadcast uh, – networks felt comfortable they could go out and spend because they knew it would be there yeah i think that's right and, and so that's that's a huge advantage for us right now just like the, you mentioned with the nfl number two um we've got an unbelievable ownership group uh you know we've got committed owners we've got deep pocketed owners with resources with relationships in the media space uh and beyond um so i think that that bodes really well for us um and then and then obviously uh number three is we've got a great growth story to tell um, and, and a big part of that growth story is the next media deal. Um, I think that the work that's being laid over the last couple of years, not just with Don Garber, but with Mark Abbott and with Gary Stevenson really uh, running point on it with his experience um, and our, you know, our ownership committees that are, that are working on it, I think we're really well positioned. And you're right, the, the content uh, demand is there. Um, we, we have a lot to prove uh, in terms of growing our fan base, but I think we're doing that. Um, and I think that this is a really good moment for us. And we've got, you know, we're not under the gun in terms of our media rights deal in terms of getting it done in the very short term. Um, and there are a lot of players, new players and existing players emerging uh, that, that, that I think will be interested. Since you're in D.C., let's stick with a, uh, a Washington thing of follow the money in Watergate. You know, I, I love the line. I always follow the money. Where's the smart money going? I would be pretty comfortable if I saw... David Tepper moving in a direction, the Wilfs, the Haslams. What does it say, if anything? Maybe it's just the price for entry is lower than the other leagues they're already a part of. But what does it say that those are the people already involved in sports in other leagues coming into MLS as well? Makes me feel really good. I got to tell you, a lot of people smarter than me. Uh, you know, my partner in D.C., Steve Kaplan, one of the smartest people I, I, I've known. Uh, one, one of my closest friends, uh, when he decided to jump into the league and join me in 2018, uh, that made me feel great. Um, I think I think that's happening because, listen, this is a league that's only in its 26th year. Um, and you look back at some of these other pro sports leagues, where they were in their 26th year, and you think about the growth, you think about the demographics of the United States and people who are being born in this country, coming to this country, what their passion is for our sport. Um, and, and the wind is at our back. Uh, we certainly have to execute um, to be to really be effective in terms of growing the interest and excitement level of the sport and the league. Um, but we're there. We really have a massive opportunity to do that. And so you're right. When you think about the people investing and um, why they're making that investment, um, it, it becomes clear that there's a massive growth opportunity here in year 26 in Major League Soccer.
since you brought up the changing demographics of the country, let me ask about Liga MX. Insane numbers in the U.S. and Spanish language TV only. We keep hearing about the possibility of MLS Liga MX merger. Where do you stand? Do you see it as a, a viable option or something that could happen? You know, I don't think it's really binary. Um, I don't think it's, you know, we stay in our lane, they stay in their lane, or we merge. I, where I see it is the growth of the collaboration between the leagues, um, I think, can really advantage both leagues. Um, and I think the growth of the collaboration uh, of clubs in, you know, playing each other in competition is going to be really valuable. Um, so I see that moving forward. I think that'll add value uh, to what we're doing in MLS. I think it'll add value to League of Mex. And, and you know, you're seeing some cross ownership now. You're seeing some investment in Liga MX from the U.S. Um, I think those relationships uh, add value to, to, the, to the growth uh, of, of both leagues and to the opportunities that will exist for the collaboration to continue. What's your response to skeptics? I won't say critics, the skeptics who would say, let's look at the multiples of revenue that are being paid for these franchises and say it's sort of out of whack with what you see in the other leagues. Yeah, I think, I think that if you don't believe in the growth story, if you don't believe that soccer is growing in the U.S., that MLS is, is, has, has a really strong growth trajectory, um, if you, then, then, then this isn't the league for you, right? Then, then go measure it against leagues that are 100 years old and say, what's the, what's the revenue multiple? Um, but this is about where the opportunity lies. This is about looking around the corner and saying, where is that growth trajectory? Where does soccer fit in to Gen Zers? Who are how are they consuming their content you know how long and i mentioned earlier how long is their attention span what is the amount of action you're going to see in 90 minutes in a soccer game um and so when if you believe that growth story you're not tied to the traditional metrics you're looking at different metrics you're looking at gross growth play and you're thinking about where uh the country is going uh where the league is going and where the sport is growing um and and the demand for it internationally is there so, so that's what draws me to the league. That's what drew me 10 years ago. I think the quality of play has gotten so much better, Scott. I look back at the team we had in 2012, my first year, and we got to the conference finals. And I said, this is going to be easy. You know, we, were, we were almost host of the MLS Cup. But, but I look at that team, and I'm not sure there's a single starter on that team that would start for us today because the quality of play in the United States and in MLS from international players coming in has gotten so much better and the league has gotten younger and, and more vibrant and, and the, the quality of coaching has gotten better. Um, so the product is just rising and rising and growing. And I'll tell you, as a team operator, we've got to keep up with that. There are a lot of challenges there because when the LAFCs and the Atlanta Uniteds get in the league and you see the kind of resources they're putting behind their strategies for success, um, certainly there's a challenge there, but overall the product is just unbelievably growing and improving. All right. I'll get you out of here on this. Clearly in your NBA days, you learned the value of star power. You know what a star does and can drive. You had Wayne Rooney at DC United. What was the short-term effect, long-term effect? Did you see a bounce? Did you see a day or do you see a day where the top names in soccer are playing in this league? I do see that day because of the economic engine that is the United States and the, the, the people that are living in this country and, and where this country is headed. I do see that day. Wayne Rooney, overall, I think it was a real success for us. Um, it had an opportunity not to be. Um, you know, he was 32 years old when he came in the league. He had a lot of wear on his tires. We didn't know how much more soccer he had in him. We knew he was unbelievably gifted as a player. He created moments that people talk about today. I was at the game uh, last night. And people were saying, I was there when Wayne Rooney, you know, did X, Y, and Z when he, he chipped the keeper from 80 yards. Um, he created moments that are indelibly linked to our franchise and our fan base. Um, he created excitement. I think you're going to see younger and younger stars coming in the league. You're already seeing that. Um, as we become, MLS becomes more engaged in the world soccer market, player market. Um, but yeah, I think you're going to see stars in their prime wanting to be in MLS in the next decade um and that's really exciting i think that's going to drive eyeballs internationally we've talked a lot about you know the media rights deal we're talking about the domestic rights we're talking about the hundreds of millions of americans who might want to watch the sport but i think when you start seeing those stars in their 20s coming into our league um and the excitement they're going to bring internationally i think you're going to start looking at the media rights differently 
because you've got a whole market for international media rights in soccer that you may not have in other sports. Um, and that's going to be a key driver over the next 10 to 20 years. Right. Before we do next year's valuations, you'll write your value on a piece of paper. I'll write mine with absolutely no advanced knowledge from Kurt Badenhausen. Closest without going over, get to dinner at Old Ebbets Grill. I'm in. I'm in. Sounds great, man. Thanks, Scott. All right. Jason Levy, co-chairman and CEO of DC United. Thanks so much, my friend. Enjoyed it. See ya.